Good morning and welcome to the Ralph Bunch Library at the U.S. Department of State. My name is Mario Criffo and I'm the spokesperson for uh, the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor Affairs. I'm pleased to welcome you to this uh, panel discussion on international press freedom. Uh, this panel is part of the State Department's State of Rights series uh, and is also a part of our Human Rights Week, Week programming, which technically doesn't begin until uh, December 3rd, which is the kickoff for, for Human Rights Week, but we wanted to take advantage of the fact that we have uh, two of the four uh, international press freedom awardees of the Committee to Protect Journalists here in Washington this week, and we wanted to take this opportunity to highlight their work and their resilience under enormous, the enormous threats they've faced uh, doing their work. Uh, today's program is being taped for broadcast, so we ask you to take a moment to silence your mobile devices uh, at this time. So let's begin by introducing and congratulating uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists International Press Freedom Awardees for 2016. Uh, first, uh, I'll mention Malini Supramaniam. She is a journalist from Chhattisgarh, India, which is the epicenter of conflict between insurgents and uh, government security forces. Uh, she is a contributor to the news website The Scroll and has reported on alleged abuses by police uh, and security for, uh, forces, uh, including alleged sexual violence against women and alleged uh, extrajudicial killings. Uh, because of her work, Malini has been uh, interrogated, surveilled, harassed um, uh, uh, by members of pro-police vigilante groups. Uh, Malini decided to leave uh, Chattisgarh, her home, uh, when the threats began to target also her family and colleagues, and she is one of CPJ's International Press Freedom Awardees this year. Also an awardee is Oscar Martinez. Oscar is co-founder of Sala Negra, uh, which is an investigative unit uh, in El Salvador that covers gang violence across Central America for the online news magazine El Faro. Uh, for years, Oscar has also fo followed migrants as they traveled north and documented abuses against them. Last year, Oscar was forced to leave his native El Salvador for a period after he received death threats following his investigation into the killing of eight gang members. And finally, I'd also like to introduce Courtney Radish, who is the advocacy director at the Committee to Protect Journalists. Uh, Courtney is a journalist, a researcher, and a free expression advocate, uh, and she's previously worked with the New York Times, Freedom House, UNESCO, Al Arabiya, uh, and the Daily Star in Lebanon. So please help me welcome our panelists today. So why don't we start our, uh, um, our discussion uh, with you, Malini. Uh, I'd like to ask you about uh, some of the work that you've done. You know, the work that you've done uh, covering violence in your home state in, in India um, is, is very clearly dangerous and you've been targeted as a result. And I know over the course of your career, many people have advised you to stop uh, doing this work. So can you tell us what, what has called you to do this kind of work? Why is this important to you? Well, I think um, I spent uh, years uh, in that place, and uh, what's happening there cannot go unreported, is what I felt primarily. Uh, and also because uh, these stories were not coming out. There was a very clear uh, instruction by the government that these stories will not come out. Uh, even if national media did report, uh, they would come from Delhi, come for a day or two, uh, and normally what happens is, you know, one incident occurs. They will talk about the blast having happened, so many killed, uh, this has happened, you know, and a large part of it would be from the police press release. Uh, but actually what is happening to the villages? Where are they? What, what are they facing? Those are something which, which needed a bit of, uh, you know, a visit a little later to get the stories out. And since I was living uh, in, in Bastar, in, in that particular place, uh, it was easier for me to go and also talk about it. Yeah. So my years of work in the region uh, as a humanitarian worker also exposed me the kind of situation that the uh, simple villagers or Adivasis were going through. And their voices were not being amplified at all in the media. And that sort of, uh, despite advisors, despite, we knew that there was a history of repression by the state in the earlier phase in during 2005 and again in 2009. I knew this would happen. And I said, let me write about it and as much as you can. Well, what's been the most difficult uh, story that you've reported on? Uh, difficult in terms of, uh, you know, 
after I was hounded out, again, I did one story on a fake encounter. Uh, that was difficult because you were yourself feeling a little fearful of how do you, how you enter. And I knew the police officers were not willing to talk to me because I needed to get their version as well. Uh, so that was personally a little difficult after having gone through that. But uh, one of the most challenging ones were when they strategically started bringing in a lot of villages in those areas, uh, declaring them to be Maoists and then asking them to surrender. Yeah? So what they did was they would uh, go into the villages, uh, pile a lot of cases against them, and then they would negotiate with them. Either you have cases against you, we'll you know, take the process ahead, or we can have you surrender as a Maoist. So the villages were at a loss. So they wouldn't know how to talk about it to the media. So that was difficult. So in that sense, it was a little challenging for me as a reporter to get down to the actual truth. And I was able to uh, make a breakthrough in that and break that story. And that, I think, annoyed uh, the police quite a bit. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah you, you said that it was uh, particularly challenging for you to get the police side of the story, and that was uh, um, important for you to, 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 to do as a, as a journalist. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to ask you, as a woman doing this, this kind of work, do you feel like you've experienced any particular, particularly um, any additional challenges um, as a woman, r restricted access to information or um, particular kinds of harassment? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, this, the, the, you know, as a woman, to be able to go into those areas, either you needed a, somebody to take you there in a jeep or on a mobile because those are not uh, places where you get public transport. Um, I rode a bike, so it was easy for me to get into those places. Uh, even when you went to the, because you had to register at each of the checkpoints. So, you know, when you get off the bike and people see you, uh, they sort of back off a little bit, and then there is a class part of it. They would, they would wonder why is this person who is English speaking wants to live in an area like this. So the opinions are already started. They've started making, and most of the opinion was about probably she's come to do some uh, anti-national, you know, kind of work. Otherwise, why would an educated Indian be wanting to stay in this region? She can easily go to a you know metropolitan city to work. So that was some of the biases that the government themselves were, or the government functions were carrying with them. Um, when I got harassed or attacked, uh, the first thing that they would attack is your personal front. Mm, how come you're staying alone? How come you're uh, by yourself? And you know, how come you have, how are you able to live in this kind of a house? And you know, those kind of things. So instantly your family worried about it. Yeah. So those are the other first questions that they would attack on your personal friends. So as a woman, yes, you do face a lot of uh, uh, difficulties in uh, physical difficulties as well, as well as, uh, you know, they will try to, like, for example, they would incite uh, my neighbor. They, in fact, what they did was they incited my neighbors to throw stones, to throw me out of the place, almost like a witch hunting, you know, and uh, getting people to talk against me. So even when you're walking on the street, you start, suddenly start seeing that people are looking at you in a funny way that how come, you know, is this the one? No? So they would create a kind of a narrative about such terrorists and they are so bad and things, and then they will pack you into one of them. So then it was open for the public to take action. No? And then the police will not take action against those people who want to do it. So that's how it is. So as a woman, you would face a, diff a, a, a gendered kind of a, uh, uh, a you know, uh, harassment of mm -hmm. this kind. Yeah? Uh, they, like, they would bring you into the police station and make you sit there for hours together in the midst of policemen. Yeah? But uh, yeah, in, in order to make you feel uncomfortable, in order to make you feel uh, scared, late into the night they'll make you sit, and then they'll release you at 11 in the night. You know? So yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, earlier this year, you decided to leave your home in Chhattisgarh and, and relocate to Hyderabad. Um, what factored into that that decision, and, and what have you been doing in Hyderabad? Okay, yeah. The the while I was being trailed, and uh, I was being questioned about the kind of work that I was doing. So what the police did was they they actually created a vigilant group, a civil vigilant group, and they send them to my house. About 20, 25 men came into my house and barged into the house. And then they said that, well, we want to know about you. So who do you stay with? Where are you living alone? And uh, who else is there? I had a daughter. I have my daughter with me. 
and uh, you know and then they started making it so difficult and then i said okay we can discuss about it you know can we sit and talk about it over a cup of tea or something and make it a little more relaxed uh, but then they threatened he said you will not write anything that tarnishes the image of the police the bastar police which is doing such fantastic work uh, they they left and within hours late into the night the police came in and started again the same question we have a complaint against you and it was so awkward at 11 in the night 12 in the night the police was hanging around with three jeeps full and you don't know what what to make out of it i started calling the senior officers they refused to re receive my phone and the after which it started and that happened when i broke that news about the surrenders that they managed to get villagers to do and i broke that news and then they uh sort of trailed me continuously i continued to write i said okay this is what they want they want me to stop writing and i continued to write in fact i packed a story on trafficking and uh, then on another surrender when i went they refused to let me meet the people i managed to go there and finally it came about when they you know burnt effigies in the middle of the center of the market then they came onto my house and they started telling my neighbors to throw me out and finally uh, they started attacking me with stones they started putting stones onto my house and you know so i again i said okay i didn't expect i mean you also grown up knowing your country in a different way so uh, i really thought this cannot happen <laughs> uh, when it did happen i said i okay i need to file my complaint i must say here that i had uh, uh another set of friends in the sense that there was set of women who were doing pro bono work uh legal aid support to the adivasi community they were there there was an uh, uh, jagdalpur legal aid group there was also a researcher who was there so we sort of built a kind of a solidarity amongst us that was so important for us and we knew that this is coming one after the other they were earlier trying to get the lawyers out they started out on me and in this way by physically attacking you know and afterwards also by not taking action against those very people that sort of gave a message that they are serious about it in fact we even had the serious senior police officers come and visit my house and say okay you continue with your work and we will continue with your, our work but then they got my landlord had me evicted they had my domestic help they detained her for long hours until 12 in the night not letting her go and her family started getting you know very worried they started panicking so you know when they knew that they couldn't uh, uh do much to us they they were not able to threaten us they started doing all other kinds of things which sort of then my editor said that i think it's best you leave otherwise they were trying to file cases against me and it's very easy we have a chatisgarh state public security act by which you can you know the simplest of thing you can say that okay we have record that you have been uh in touch with the maoists or that we found something in your house which is not uh you know which is anti national their literature you know we have seen this happening in the villages no something would be planted into the hou houses and this is easy to vacuum so that's when my editor said i think you should leave and wait for a while till things settle down but it did not settle and the attacks continued in fact the other uh, tribal activist soni sori she was uh, you know when she was driving back home around 9 in the night uh, she had a black suit thrown against her and she was hospitalized that sort of gave us a message that it's is it really worth taking such a big risk so when i decided to move to hyderabad uh now in hyderabad it's a neighboring state telangana uh i continue to do the stories because stories are continuing to happen you know? and uh, so much so that there are now cases against researchers and you know that that's continue continue to be happening and there's complete impunity and that that's what makes you feel so sad i mean despite all this you know the, the impunity continues so strongly that people who are perpetrators within this department they are not being uh, taken an, any action against and uh, so i continue to do the story and i did a story in fact we broke one story uh, i did it along with my other colleague we had to walk 20 kilometers 30 kilometers to reach the village there was a encounter death and there was a girl who was uh, you know pulled out of a home and then she was made to wear a uniform and then she was uh, killed there and do we managed to reach the village speak to the parents and finally with the, you know they she took she took legal stands of asking the exhumation of the body and the case is now continuing so i mean it's sad i feel that uh, for 3 months i was in a state of i i didn't know what was happening to me you know i didn't i felt hated myself for having left that place i wish i could have done something to stay on and i said okay they succeeded in doing what they wanted to do uh in a way i feel 
good about having done this story because it gave me the courage again. Uh, that of course angered them further because just a month, or uh, 15 days back, uh, there was another CBI report which indicted the police for having committed a lot of uh, crimes and again had refugees of me and some other people burn up. Yeah, so they're not, they're continuing to have the kind of, uh, uh, you know, an oppressive kind of an atmosphere for journalists to come and report and even talk about what's happening there. Yeah, so I do the stories. It slows me down. You know, you have to take a lot of uh, planning and ensure that you don't get into unwanted. Uh, the police, we know how, we, how they act. There are a lot of people... Uh, like a, squads that they have on the streets who will keep a watch on you. And I was very happy, but for a long time, I kept my photograph away. <laughs> because once a photograph is out, then you, you know, you're very easily identifiable. And in those places, so it gets very difficult. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I continue to... Well, it's 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 good to hear that you're you're able to continue the work even even from Hyderabad, and you found you found ways to ways to do that. Okay, let's um, uh, let's talk with Oscar for uh, uh, for a few minutes, and I, I know uh, folks will have lots and lots of questions for for all three of you, so I want to make sure we we reserve plenty of time for that as well. Um, so, Oscar um, uh, Sala Negra, which you founded in in 2011, very quickly gained uh, a reputation for conducting very hard hitting uh, uh, journalism, a and your subject matter, which is allegations of uh, extrajudicial killings, is one that is uh, particularly uh, taboo in, in El Salvador. What brought you to, to the point where you wanted to found this um, uh, this investigative unit and engage in this kind of work? Okay, uh, first of all, uh, CPJ, do not believe me, but my English is far, far from being perfect. So I apologize, but here I go. Uh, okay, we. Uh, I work for, first, I work for three years uh, in Mexico in another project of uh, investigative journalism uh, that we create in El Faro. We travel with Central American migrants across Mexico in a moment where Mexico uh, lived that period where Los Zetas, for example, discovered that they can make a lot of money kidnapping migrants, for example, or open routes of uh, uh, where they put uh, women in brothels in the south of Mexico. So I remember that uh, uh, doing that coverage in, in Mexico, one uh, American priest in uh, the city of Ixtepec, Oaxaca, south of Mexico, asked us one question. And I said, us because I was working with, with a team. And he asked us, why they flee? What happened in your region if they are able to cross Mexico under that circumstances? And I couldn't answer that question. I mean, in, in Central America, we arrived, we as journalists, and I don't, and after that, I'm gonna talk about politicians, but as journalists, we arrived very, very late to the topic of gangs. We did not understood what happened with gangs. We didn't understand the difference between MS-13 and 18 street gang. We cannot explain the internal organization and and, and 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 I discovered that in, after the project of, of with migrants so I went back to El Salvador in 2011 in 2010 and in 2011 in January with uh, five colleagues from El Faro we create Sala Negra with uh, Sala Negra make coverage about organized crime and gangs violence in Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. And at the beginning, we started mm, with some coverage in Nicaragua because we, gonna, we, we, we tried to explain why a country ha who had a war, who is very poor, is n not a, a very violent country. Why, why that happened in Nicaragua? Why they, they, they have no gangs, for example? So the logic of Sala Negra was try to explain the main issues. For example, it's MS-13 or 18th Street uh, groups like cartels mexicanos, for example. Mm -hmm. They do a lot of money. How they, 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 they work, how they organize inside, how they control neighborhoods in San Salvador or Guatemala, or what's the difference and what's the, 
the, the way of, I don't know how to say the word convivir in, in English. Mm. Mm -hmm. How they live together with, for example, a cartel in Guatemala. Uh, what's the relation between gangs and cartels in some, in some places? So uh, we spent uh, the last six years making that coverage, but last year, no, not last year, in March of 2012, the situation changed because the, the Salvadorian government, government made a truce with gangs. You know, the, the, the government of Mauricio Funes, he gonna say, and he gonna repeat one and again that it was not a truce between the government and gangs, but uh, it was. I, in fact, the, 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 the ex-minister of security say it on the record, how they create the strategy into his office. So the truth was so particular that we start to focus on El Salvador. And after the truth, it was impossible to get away from El Salvador because the period, what happened with the truth, government, that's, it's weird to say it, but government betrayed gangs and gangs start to apply. Uh, last year was the most violent year in the whole century for El Salvador. We had a rate of 103 homicides per 100 of thousand habitants. I'm gonna put that on perspective. The most violent Mexico, the state of Guerrero, the rate, the rate in the state of Guerrero is 35. All rate is 103. That's like a war area rate, 35 homicides uh, as a rate for us. That, that, that's what we call peace. So last year, the war between the state and gangs changed everything. We can talk. Uh, more about that, but uh, but, but I'm going to move on with the other questions. If you well, want. I, I, you know, I, I want you to talk a little bit about um, the challenge of doing work that you know criticizes the gangs, but also criticizes government. Many in El Salvador, I know, view any sort of criticism of uh, of government, including the police, as uh, as siding with the gangs. And 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 how has that perception uh, affected your work? And how have you and how have you accounted for that in your work? Okay. We confront and we understood, like, since the truth, uh, as journalists, we understood one thing. We're going to write against the public. People don't going to clap us for writing in El Salvador. In El Salvador, people want to hear about bullets and dead gang members, and we cannot do that job. I mean, we cannot. We are journalists. We put, try to put light on the dark corners of our societies. So... After, for example, the, the, the publication of the, of the San Blas massacre, where police killed eight persons, six gang members, criminals, and two civilians. In El Salvador, we say civilian when we talk about a not gang member. Uh, but there is like a consensus. I don't know if I, I, I made that word or exist. Consensus? To say consensus. Mm -hmm. There is a consensus in El Salvador, and, and it has to be with the story of the country. People think that the problems can resolve with bullets, and, and that's like a hard belief in El Salvador. I mean, that's the way that we try to use for a lot of decades. And the government support that idea. For example, the, uh, the last week, Guillermo Gallegos was, uh, uh, became in the president of the Congress in El Salvador. He's a politician who supports the death penalty and who put on, on his Twitter uh, images of dead gang members after confrontation with that the kind of politicians that people want in El Salvador. So when you publish that kind of thing, you're going to confront that people going to call you gang member. And the cops who live a very awful situation in El Salvador, they have miserable salaries. 
uh, they live, they are the authority by day, but they live in neighborhoods under control of gangs. They have to, to the, their mothers pay rent, extortion to gangs. So cops want to kill. It's obviously, and I understand that feeling in the Salvadorian corporation. So we have, uh, so they get very angry with, we publish that kind of thing. We receive threats. They look for us in our houses. One, that's going to sound weird too, but El Salvador is a very small country. So one member of a killing group talked to us and said, and said to us, they're going to kill you on Monday. So try to not be on Monday in the country. And that's what we do. But it's a very explosive situation around El Salvador. I'm, I'm, I'm sure, I, uh, of course, that if you go to El Salvador right now and you uh, spend a few days in the Radisson Hotel, you're not going to see anything about that situation. You can walk and you can drink a beer. There's no problem. But if you go to the neighborhoods under control of gangs, the situation that that people experiment is more than a war, than a problem of public security. Uh, three or f uh, the, the average is four shootings in between three and uh, during the year, the year, I mean, the, the, it's like three or four shootings every day. Uh, in the last week, and I finish with that, in the last week, <coughs> gang members kill six cops, two soldiers. They, in fact, take off the head of one of the soldiers. Last weekend, the police respond to that offensive of gangs, killing 37 gang members in different shootings. Why, why I do that? Because as we prove, some one of that shootings wasn't shootings, and some one of that gang members wasn't gang members. Thank you. Thank you very much, you. Oscar. And we understood every word. Don't worry. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Courtney, I'd like to turn to you for, for a few minutes. This is the 11th year, I think, that CPJ has been giving out uh, this award. Why does CPJ give out this award, and what's, what's the significance of this award? Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Um, this award is, we give it every year to four journalists, and it's meant to recognize journalists who are working under really extreme conditions to make sure that the world knows, and as Oscar says, bring light to the darkest corners of the world. You know, journalists play a special role in our societies because they are the voice for the voiceless. And they are the way that most of us know most of what we know is because of journalists. And so the International Press Freedom Award is designed to um, help elevate uh, their work, bring attention to it, hopefully provide protection by some of this international recognition. We know that, you know, in most cases, um, greater publicity can lead to greater safety for journalists who are working under extreme threats. I would say that's primarily when they're governmental threats. I think that does not apply in the case of um, non-state actors to the same extent. And usually we recognize um, one journalist who is behind bars. And this year, that journalist is Mahmoud Abu Zayed, who is an Egyptian journalist better known um, as Shao Khan. He's a young photojournalist who was in uh, Rabah on the day of what became known as the Rabah massacre. And he was taking photographs as photojournalists do, and in fact, working with two other journalists um, both of whom had the benefit of not being Egyptian because they were released the same day that they were arrested. But he has now been behind bars for four years. And when we first started advocating on his case, um, actually my, myself and a colleague went to Egypt and we, uh, were, we met with the Minister of Transitional Justice with the equivalent of the Attorney General with uh, a high-level official and the Minister of Interior and, and, and others and made sure that they were aware of his case because there's no evidence against him. Um, he's not a member of the Muslim Brotherhood and he was not you know, was not political before this. Uh, there are letters of support from the photo agencies that um, took his photos and 
I have to say, you know, when, when we left, I wrote a blog that said a slight glimmer of hope in a very sad situation. I, I actually lived in journalist in, in, in Egypt and did journalism and research there. And when I lived there, there were no journalists in prison and no journalists killed. Um, now, Egypt is the second largest journal, jailer of journalists in the world which is shocking um, to us. And there are at least six journalists who have been killed and no, uh, you know, no justice for their murders. And a complete lack of understanding by the authorities there about the role of, uh, of the media and a free press in any sort of democratic transition. So, you know, in his case particularly, we are hoping that bringing this attention to his case, I think there's another hearing um, on Saturday, will A, help divide out his case. So he's part of this mass trial of hundreds of people who are on trial, mainly Muslim Brotherhood. So one, we want to separate his case out. You know, he needs to just have his own situation assessed. And then, of course, we want the charges dropped or a pardon or whatever we can do to get him out because it's just ridiculous that he's behind bars. The other journalist we're honoring is Chan Dundar, who is the editor uh, in chief of Chumhuriyat. So um, he was also, he, he's from Turkey, and I'm sure all of you in the State Department have, are aware of the incredibly perilous situation that the press is facing there. So we actually saw the crackdown on the press happening and preceding the coup. And this is something we see, you know, many places that you'll see the squeeze come on journalists and come on media and, you know, attempt to gain control before you know, political action. We've seen this um, around the world in different situations. So he was um, arrested and, and charged after he published an article that alleged um, illegal, that showed evidence of um, illegal arm, or I don't know whether it was illegal or not, but it was arms transfer by the, um, you know, from Turkey to rebels in Syria. This is incredibly important information. This is information that policymakers around the world, the public wants to know. Um, and he was charged with terrorism or uh, aiding and abetting. Um, and, and we're seeing this around the world, that journalists who are just doing their job, especially in Turkey, anyone who's traveling to the south of Turkey or trying to report on uh, the, the Muslim Brotherhood or now on the Gulen movement is being equated with doing terrorism or supporting terrorism. So he was tried. Um, he was in jail for 92 days and then released on appeal and then shot at, and thankfully he's okay. Um, but then he was out of the country um, during the appeal, and now his wife is not able to leave. So he's here to get this award, and his wife can't be here with him because Turkey has canceled or confiscated the passports of dozens of reporters. Um, and we at CPJ, uh, at the Committee to Protect Journalists, one of the things we do is um, help journalists in distress. And we've had several calls from journalists who have been unable to travel out of Turkey or unable to travel because they had, you know, some sort of documents. And it's unclear whether or not Interpol is, you know, um, recognizing um, those cancellations, et cetera. But basically, um, you know, both of these countries, Turkey and Egypt, are experiencing probably the worst crackdowns on the press that we've seen in recent history. And so, you know, these awards are designed to bring attention to those situations. Um, Turkey and Egypt, you've heard about. I think people are much less familiar with what's happening in India and El Salvador. So we really try to make a mix and, um, you know, bring amazing people who can put a, a face to the challenges that journalists around the world face. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Courtney. And it's great that the award is able to bring uh, to light such diversity in the kinds of challenges that are faced uh, by journalists around the world. Um, so with that, we have about uh, 20 minutes, 25 minutes uh, left. We'll open it up to the audience for questions. And I think we've got a, a microphone that will come uh, floating around. Well, why don't I ask the first question? I'll take moderator's privilege to ask the first question. And um, uh, I'd like to ask uh, uh, both of you, Malini and Oscar, um, what has uh, receiving the award meant? What, what, what does it mean for your work uh, and your ability to continue doing, doing your work and the community of journalists that you work with in your, in your countries? 
Okay, my, I have a short answer for. <laughs> in the history of El Faro, uh, uh, we don't have and, and we never had good relation with any government in El Salvador. We are journalists. The issue that protect us was that kind of recon international recognition. I mean, that kind of message who said one very clear thing to a country like El Salvador and to the authorities mainly. If that happened to that people, something gonna happen. I mean, it's, it's something gonna happen and there's gonna be troubles. So uh, that's our umbrella of protection and, and that's very important to us. And, 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 and I'm not just saying that because I'm in front of them, really. That happened, for example, after San Blas massacre. It, it, it happened. It, it, the, the, a lot of embassies and organizations pronounced about uh, the situation in El Salvador, and the government had to ask us, <laughs> please, to come to the, to the presidential house to talk about the problem. So it's useful. Really, it's, in the practice, it's very useful, and it's our umbrella. Yeah, I too feel that this, uh, the award from the CPJ is important, uh, is an important message to the country. And because that is exactly what they didn't want. They didn't want the stories that are there hidden, um, undiscovered, and they would rather not anybody know about it. If anybody were to talk about conflict because a government doesn't acknowledge that there is a situation of actually an armed conflict. One knows about Kashmir. Yeah? One knows about fairly about some amount of such situation in the northeastern states of India. But this entire stretch of about nine intensely, intensively affected states in uh, India on the uh, Maoist insurgency, not many are aware of it. And the manner in which is, it is being uh, dealt with is what we were highlighting about. Uh, so in that sense, it is important for us, this kind of recognition, to bring it out uh, into the world that the largest democracy uh, has problems and it needs to deal with it differently, not in this manner, not in a militarized way, not in a way that you are curbing the rights of the indigenous people not corporate interests which will take away the forests and the minerals that are there. Yeah? So those are the things that the civil societies were addressing. Even our own autonomous body then begin to start taking a look at the National Human Rights Commission, the Press Council of India, the Editors Guild, they've all come about. And I think that sort of, uh, how do you say, reactivates uh, all these institutions which would rather not talk about it because a very clear uh, within the country, the clear narration is that if you talk about these things, then you are actually siding with the Maoists. And if you are uh, not, then you are, you know, you're a nationalistic, very good kind of a thing. So that uh, thing is good that it, it's broken that. It, it is also, a, a, I, I see this as an, an award not just for me, but for a lot of people who are there in Chhattisgarh. In fact, four people, two people got arrested before I uh, was driven out after which again two persons were arrested, out of which three are out, two on bail and one whose case did not hold ground at all against him, no evidence was found of him. And this one person continues to be in prison and we're really working hard to get him out. And we're going to use this as a, as a leverage to get, 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 get even a bail. I mean, he's been there for one and a half, two years, but even he hasn't even got a bail. The state is refusing him even a bail. So that's the seriousness of it, and we hope that this award recognizes the strength of the journalists that are struggling to get things out. So that's what I'm going to do. Thank you. Okay. And, uh, and while the microphone makes it over, um, over to you. Uh, Courtney, can you uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, the visit that uh, the the uh, the awardees have? I know the award will uh, formally be conferred on on Tuesday next week in in New York, but tell us about the Washington part of the trip and why what, what's been important about that. Sure. So every year we bring the awardees to Washington, and we do that because the United States plays such an important role 
in holding up press freedom around the world and being an ally to journalists and activists and you know so many others who are under threat. It's the U.S. leadership on press freedom, on human rights, that you know, journalists around the world are able to call on, whether that's um, through IVLP programs, um, through being able to call the embassy if they are under threat. Um, and then, of course, the moral power that statements by the president or by um, people in the State Department or other high-level officials, they have an impact. We saw this in Ethiopia before President Obama went there for a meeting over the summer. They finally released the Zone 9 bloggers. Sadly, there have been re-arrests, but we saw that we can see the power. And so one of the reasons we bring them here is to really emphasize to um, the policy establishment, to Congress, uh, how important U.S. leadership on these issues is and what a difference it does make when you speak out, when they, you know, when they are here to support um, journalists around the world. They might not be citizens, but they're playing an important role um, for United States citizens and policymakers because of the work that they do. Thank you, Courtney. Go ahead. Okay, um, I'll stand up a little bit. Thank you for your comments about U.S. leadership. That's something that, um, as a member of the Human Rights Bureau, we're working to continue, and it helps to hear directly from you about the dynamics that you're facing. I want to let you know about a law that we have called the Leahy Law that restricts transfers of... Um, Basically, we have a law that restricts uh, training and transfers of military equipment to forces that are known to be human rights abusers. It helps when we work to enact that law to have information on the force and the unit that abusive uh, security forces come from. So I would encourage you to let people know that that information is important for us to continue in that work as a matter of law and not just as a matter of policy. I have a specific question for Malini. Um, I'd like to... To say what the trend line you've seen is since Prime Minister Modi's ascendance to power, has there been an increase in Chhattisgarh Public Security Act enforcement, or any other comments you could give? I, I didn't get the last uh, part of it. Modi, like how Mr. since Modi took. Well, um, it's not a very happy scene. Uh, in the sense that the kind of impunity that is being uh, enjoyed by, uh, by, by the machineries in the state government actually uh, use this saying that we have at the center also a similar government, so they are going to back us up. Um, and we have appealed to you know, the, the situation of journalists in Chhattisgarh and also in India, for that matter, you have seen the kind of ban that has been placed on NDTV for a day, which again, of course, had to, they had to revoke. Uh, these things are not augering too well. Uh, there is a lot of discontent on that front. And uh, also the situation of the minorities, especially the Christian minority, it has been constantly been in news. And uh, we are aware that uh, US representatives wanted to come to India that they were also denied visas. Uh, the, uh, you know, there is a very strong um, corporate interest in places like Chhattisgarh. Uh, no doubt about it, there is rich mineral there. Yeah? And it's going to get a lot of income to the state and the center. There are a lot of projects, which are national projects, which are like waiting since 1990s. Yeah? And uh, but parallelly, there are also huge gaps in the development. Yeah. Schools are so poorly done. Health system is so, it's like falling apart. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's little uh, uh, disturbing to see that there is a very, very strong push. Earlier, when the UPA government was there, uh, at least, uh, you know, if there are any complaints that are going against a senior police officer or a senior secretary uh, within the state of, uh, you know, of overlooking such kind of a gross human rights violations, then they would be transferred. But now even that doesn't happen. Yeah. So there is a very clear message. The uh, different secretary and everybody is, you know, 
as soon as there is a strong, uh, you know, there's an uproar about such things, they would actually visit the place back again and uh, say that, you know, good work is being done. And also that, you know, we will see to it that, you know, within a few years, we will get the companies with whom we have taken an M done an MOU, they will start rolling the program because they have not been able to uh, take the minerals out. There's the, there is a strong resistance to that entire process. So it, it's, it's a very strange kind of combination where both the governments in the state and the center are the same. And there is very little, uh, in that sense, opposition coming out. So the center's message to this entire process, uh, though you know you you had at one point you 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 spoke about Mr. Modi. Mr. Modi came and gave a huge, you know, Ramnath Goenka award. This is one of the prestigious awards, and he actually came and gave a speech saying that he believes in freedom of press and press should not be meddled with, and you know what happened in emergency, and et cetera. And the same evening, the news was out that NDTV will have to be banned for a day. And it was so shocking, and you could do that, you know, so blatantly. And of course, the entire media community got together and were filing a case against him, and they had to revoke. But this is going to be a constant struggle at every point of, point of time, you know, this kind of repression. Um, first off, I just want to say I admire both of you for your incredible courage. So thank you for your work and whatever keeps you going, um, totally support it. Um, my question is for Oscar. I lived in Honduras and worked at our embassy for two years, so I'm very familiar with uh, the problems that you described because Honduras um, shares a lot of those problems. And I wanted to ask you, are people willing to answer your questions when you go to interview them? Are people afraid of speaking to you, the press? Um, and, and who falls in maybe the f fearful category? Well, it, one of the things that I used to talk much than my risk is my sources' risk. For example, in a, in a, in a gang neighborhood, if you talk with somebody you can kill that people if you just ask to that people one question of or if a, of course if a cop went there th that people is, is died so yeah people is afraid to talk we find a person who can speak freely about what happened in that kind of neighborhood is very weird but in El Salvador there is thousands of of, of, of habitants who live under gun control and they are in everywhere. They work in restaurants, they work in houses. So it's not so difficult to find people who can talk about that. For me, in the last years, was more difficult, for example, to find a, a, an agent of police who talk honestly about what happened inside police. But but, but we have some sources. Too. We have some sources too. And I'm gonna uh, talk a little bit about one case, for example, when, where, where we failed thinking in what's going to happen with that person. In the massacre of San Blas, the main source was Consuelo Hernandez, 46 years old. Uh, she was the mother of Denis uh, Alexander Martinez, a 20 old guy who was not involved with guns and died in that massacre. One just, a single shot, right here. Like if he's on this, in that moment. Consuelo here, how his son died, and how, 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 how he, he asked for time to explain why he was in the same farm that the gang members. He worked there and gang members went there to hide. So we talked with a lot of uh, human rights organizations uh, about if we have to, po how, if, we, if, if it was a good idea publish the name of Consuelo. And we conclude that it was a good idea because the name of Consuelo was in all the reports of the police. They knew that she was there during the massacre. They, they already knew. So we talked with Consuelo and we published the name. Consuelo Hernandez 
refused to move from El Salvador. She cannot read. She don't know anything different but El Salvador. So it's very difficult for that kind of person to say, please imagine a life out of El Salvador right now, in this moment. Consuelo was threatened. And, and she death threatened on the phone. And the people who call her call her from his from from her son telephone. From the telephone of Dennis. And they, they, they told her that they're gonna kill her, so she flee and now she live hiding. She's part of the prosecutor's case, but she live hiding in a town in El Salvador. So yeah, it's very difficult to protect someone in El Salvador. And I think that that one of the reasons because the real story of what happened in gang neighborhood is so hidden. Because we never talk with the sources that we have, that we need to hear. It's very difficult to hear that kind of people. For example, in, in, and it's weird because that people is all over the country. But but uh, as you know, that is the the in in in. I made that point. Uh, I, I I with my English is for me impossible to 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 explain the details of what I'm gonna say. But the huge problem in El Salvador is that thousands of people suffer the problem with gangs, and the few people in the political class who discuss about. The, 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 the gang issues do not understand gangs. They do not understand gangs. The people of in the Congress do not understand gangs. A lot of cops in the medium level do not understand cops. There is just a few people who really understand why a gang member become in a, in a gang member. So that's one of the huge problems of El Salvador. They, try to resolve a problem that they cannot understand. And they don't want to hear another people. Melini, do you want to do you want to address that 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 same question with the difficulty in um, um, in getting people to talk to you sometimes? How are you able to make sure that you can cover all the sides of a story? Mm -hmm. Yes, in the sense that uh, the, the way the situation has gone on, there is a lot of mistrust. Yeah. Who do you believe? I mean, if I say something against the police, Will that be used against me if I say something that the mouse had done? Would that go against me? Yeah. So it takes time to build trust. But once that is established, in fact, that is a change that we see. Uh, in 2005 onwards, when there was a civil vigilant group was created who were armed, who would run into the villages and drag people out and, you know, force them to get into into their side, that is the government side, and you know, force them into the camps. Uh, there was a lot of mistrust, and the case was filed in Supreme Court, and finally they came up in 2011 with the thing. So uh, that mistrust continued. Uh, but by the time the second or the third phase started in 2014-15, uh, is that they realized that if they don't talk about it, they're going to lose many more people. Yeah, and. Even today, even when I'm in Hyderabad, of course, f you know, phones are being tapped. And when I left, villagers were told that uh, don't stay in touch with her if she ever calls up, or you will not talk to any of the media personnel, uh, etc. All that instructions are being given in across the camps when they come for searching. So, but the people have also realized that look, we can't we, if we continue to remain quiet and not reach out to the media or to any civil rights activists, then you're going to lose it. You're going to either leave the, you have to leave the place and move into another state, which is that about 60,000 people uh, had to leave their villages and move in, over to a neighboring Andhra Pradesh uh, state. 644 villages abandoned their homes. Yeah. So they said this again in a massive way, it can't happen. By the time they found the courage to come back, another phase started. Yeah. So it had disrupted a lot of the trust part of it, but uh, I do feel that you know uh, the advan by living there and constantly going back to the people and uh, they knew you and it was possible for them for to build a trust and then they began to talk about it and then you know okay somebody has spoken about me to her and that other person calls up they're willing to talk about it yeah. I must say, language is a huge barrier in India. You can understand what, you know, it's an Adivasi dialect. So they would actually look for a, you know, school-going person who's done even till class five, who's able to speak Hindi. Then they 
get that person across and translate it for them. Women talking about sexual assault, you know, in the most, most uh, hideous kind of crime that have happened you know, in the last uh, eight months. And uh, they, they were willing to talk about it to, you know, women activists who went there. So uh, I, I, I see that itself as a very, very positive change that people are beginning to talk, unlike the 2005 episode. So I see a lot of strength in the fact that uh, they see that if you talk about it, you're going to reach out to people and then this will also end. So I see a shift in that. So. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one more question, if there is one out there. I think, in, in, did you have a question? No. No. Okay, over here. Uh, you talked quite extensively about your problems in collecting information and doing the investigation. I wonder if you could talk a little more about the challenges of getting the information out uh, through print, broadcast, whatever media. Um, are there specific challenges or things getting easier or harder on that front? Gathering information has really been challenging, yeah, no doubt about it. Putting the information out in terms of, I was lucky to f have Scroll uh, willing to give me that space. In fact, almost every story I reported to them, they were like happy to carry it. Uh, you know, once they were clear about the credibility part of it, that yes, I visited and, and I know exactly what I'm talking about, um, then it was not such a great difficulty. But sometimes you also stand alone as you are the only one who's reporting out of that. No? So we had national media, uh, Hindu, Indian Express, a lot of newspapers, Hindustan Times, but most of them were working out of Raipur, which is about 600, 900 kilometers from the place. So. So even when you got in touch with the reporters and said, look, something really drastic is happening there, and you were like, rushing out the next morning or the previous evening, it was difficult for them to reach out to that place. So, you know, th those were some of the difficulties that you are the only one reporting about it. Uh, and the second part is getting space was encouraging, so I was, I did not actually have sort of, the uh, third part of difficulty was that the fear of the source of information, telling who said it, all that was very difficult. Yeah, that that because they knew exactly what, what to do with this information. So that was a scary part of it. Yeah. Well, in my case, a, a, a difference with a lot of colleagues from Central America, mainly in the north of Central America, I don't have problems with, by publish. I work for a very particular online newspaper who called Faro. So our only uh, rule is the method, the journalistic method, so we can miss with whatever we want. And El Faro, who started to make journalists in 1998, have a good reputation in the in the region, and I think that uh, in some places, in, even here in United States and Europe, so we have we have good support in in reproductions out of the country. So. No, we have problem with sources. For example, government tried to never invite us to any conference. For example, they try to uh, publish uh, or make campaigns against or publication in another online newspaper or or, or printed newspaper. So that's the kind of situation that we confront. That, we, I, I can say that, and, and I think that that's a value of journalism. We have a lot of enemies, or people who think that are our enemies, in El Salvador and in the region, but, but they know that we are not work for anybody, that we are journalists. So they can hate what we publish, but they know, I don't know, I don't want to say that it's true because it sounds like like a big thing, but they know the, our intentions are do journalism and, and, and anything else. And, and that's very weird to find in the region. <laughs> so we, we are, we're just about out of time. I'm going to turn to Courtney just for, uh, for a kind of closing thought. Yeah, well, I just, because Chan Dundar isn't here, I think it's important to talk about Turkey because the dissemination problem is huge there. The government has taken over the news outlets, so dissemination is now a major problem. Um, I, I, and I think that, you know, 
we have to be cognizant of that. I mean, one of the, th even they, the editors, there were a group of journalists who decided to every day a different, have a different editor for this one news outlet. And then now they've charged them all and, and arrested them, including the, the head of Reporters on Frontier. So this is, you know, deeply disturbing in these countries where they're t attempting to take over government control of the media outlets or cracking down on anyone who is doing that. And as a result, CPJ started a new crackdown chronicle just to literally chronicle every single day the insane uh, level of, of press intimidation, closures, arrests, harassment, passport confiscation, etc. in Turkey. So I think we are seeing that um, there are more administrative ma manipulations, outright overtakes um, around the world uh, of the media environment. In Russia, we saw that as well, like the use of administrative, you know, saying that private television can't ad use advertising. Um, so a lot of this, this dissemination issue still remains even with you know, the, the, the internet and all of that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that, uh, Courtney, and thank you and congratulations, uh, Malini and Oscar, uh, to both of you, both for your time today and on, on your award that you'll receive uh, on Tuesday in New York. Uh, and thanks to the audience for uh, being here for what I think was a really interesting and, and um, at times very moving uh, uh, discussion. Uh, I'd like also to thank the uh, Committee to Protect Journalists uh, and the Ralph Bunch Library here at the State Department for their partnership on this panel discussion today. And this discussion will be available uh, early next week at uh, humanrights.gov uh, for viewing. Please follow DRL's Twitter account. That's at state underscore DRL. Uh, we'll have a link there once that is up and available for viewing. Thanks very much. Thank you.